Yes, Ms. Orr. Commissioner, the next two case studies will consider the handling of claims under life insurance policies. And before we call the witness in relation to the first of those case studies, we want to make some observations about the handling of claims in the life insurance industry more generally. In our opening statement on Monday, we explained that we'd sought witness statements from 10 life insurers and we summarised what those insurers had told us about the sale of life insurance products. As well as asking for information about the sale of those products, we also asked the insurers to explain their practices for handling life insurance claims, to provide us with data about the life insurance claims they had handled in the last five years, and to explain how they remunerate the personnel involved in handling life insurance claims. We want to say something about what the 10 life insurers told us on these topics. The first topic that we'll deal with is the insurer's practices for handling claims. The insurers told the Commission that a person who makes a claim under a life insurance policy must usually complete a claim form setting out certain information about the claim. The person will be assigned a claims manager or a claims consultant who will be responsible for the steps involved in handling the claim. Depending on the type of claim, it might be necessary for the claims manager to collect additional information about the claim. This is more likely in relation to a TPD or trauma claim, where complex factual questions can arise in relation to whether the insured person is totally and permanently disabled or has suffered a particular defined medical condition. The insurers told the Commission about the different sources of information and advice available to claims managers when handling claims. Among other things, claims managers can access medical advice from internal and external medical consultants and can arrange for surveillance of claimants. We'll return to the topic of surveillance later in the week. Once the claims manager has gathered information about the claim, he or she will then assess the claim against the policy terms. There are many different reasons why a life insurer might decide to deny a claim. Some of those reasons are specific to different kinds of life insurance policies, and we'll come to those shortly. We asked the 10 life insurers to provide us with information about the most common reasons why they denied life insurance claims. Those reasons included lack of eligibility, either the claimant did not meet the eligibility terms or was not covered under the policy at the relevant date, because the claim definition was not met, for example, because the insured did not meet the definition of total and permanent disability or of a specified illness under the policy, because the claim related to a pre-existing medical condition which was excluded from the cover, because there was an applicable policy exclusion clause other than a pre-existing medical condition exclusion, or because the insurer denied the claim on the basis of non-disclosure or a misrepresentation by the claimant. Some of these reasons for de declining claims will be examined in the next two case studies. The second topic that we'll deal with is the data that the life insurers provided us about the claims they've handled in the last five years. In our opening statement on Monday, we explained that there are four main types of life insurance policy. Life cover, which pays a set amount of money to beneficiaries on the death of the policyholder. Total and permanent disability, or TPD cover, which pays a lump sum to assist with rehabilitation and living costs if the policyholder becomes totally and permanently disabled. Income protection cover, which replaces income lost by the policyholder through inability to work due to injury or sickness. And trauma cover, which provides cover to the policyholder if they are diagnosed with a specified illness or injury. Each of these types of life insurance presents different issues when an insured person makes a claim. Some of these differences are illustrated by the data that the life insurers provided about the rates of declined claims and the resolution times for claims for each of the four types of life insurance policy. Before we come to that data, 
we note that the different insurers recorded or accounted for the information that the Commission asked for in different ways. This means that there were differences in the ways that information about claims was reported across the different statements. The relevant differences are explained in detail in the insurer's statements. Could we bring up RCD 0026 0002 0001? This chart shows the percentage of declined claims as a proportion of all claims received by the 10 insurers for each policy type for the 2017 to 18 financial year, with the exception of MetLife, which provided data for the 2017 calendar year. As we can see from the chart, life cover claims are declined the least frequently of the four policy types at approximately 1.7%, and trauma claims are by far the most frequently declined, with more than one in every 10 claims declined. I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 6.111, uh, chart of declined claims as percentage of all claims by product type 1 July 17 to 30 June 18, RCD 0026 0002 0001, Exhibit 6.111. Could we please now bring up RCD 0026 0002 0002? This chart shows average or mean claim resolution time by policy type, being the number of calendar days that elapse between the date of receipt of the claim form by the insurer and the date on which a decision is made about the claim. As we can see from this chart, decisions are made most quickly in respect of life cover claims, averaging approximately 27.5 days after receipt of the claim. Decisions in respect of claims for TPD take significantly longer than the other three types of policies, averaging more than 92 days to resolve. Because of these differences between the time taken to resolve claims for the different types of life insurance policy, we want to make some further observations about each type of policy in turn. Could I tender this document, Commissioner? Average number of days to resolve claims by product type 1 July 17 to 30 June 18 RCD uh, 0026 0002 0002 exhibit 6.112. And before we turn to the different types of policy in turn, we do note that the data provided by the 10 life insurers shows that the average time to resolve claims has decreased from 2013 to 2018. And this is broadly consistent across all four types of life insurance policies. The first type of policy cover that we will deal with is life cover. <coughs> As we've mentioned, life cover plays, pays a set amount of money to beneficiaries on the death of the policyholder. Uh, earlier today, I attended a number of statements concerning accidental death cover. While accidental death cover is a form of life cover in that it pays a benefit on the death of the policyholder, we've excluded accidental death cover from the data that we're about to discuss. Could we please show document RCD 0026 0002 0003? Now, this chart shows for each of the 10 insurers the percentage of claims declined as a proportion of all life cover claims received in 2017 to 2018. And as we can see from the chart, the proportion of declined life cover claims ranges from 0.3% of claims in the case of AMP to approximately 4.4% of claims in the case of Suncorp Life. I tender that document, Commissioner. The chart of declined life claims as a percentage of all life claims by entities. Uh, 1 July 17 to 30 June 18, RCD 0026 0002 0003, Exhibit 6.113. Could we please show RCD 0026 0002 0004? 
This chart shows the average time, that is the mean time, it took each of the 10 insurers to reach a decision in respect of claims received under life cover policies received in 2017 to 18. And as we can see from this chart, average resolution times ranged from 10 days for TAL to 78 days in the case of AMP. I tender that document, Commissioner. A chart of average uh, <coughs> days to resolve a life claim by entity 1 July 17 to 30 June 18, uh, RCD 0026 0002 0004, Exhibit 6.114. The second type of policy is TPD cover, which pays a lump sum, as we've said, to assist with the rehabilitation and living costs of a policyholder who becomes totally and permanently disabled. Where an insured person makes a claim under a TPD policy, one of the main areas of dispute that can arise is whether the insured is totally and permanently disabled within the meaning of the policy. As explained in background paper number 29, published on the Commission's website, different TPD policies use different definitions of total and permanent disability. The most common requires that the insured is incapacitated to such an extent as to render him or her unlikely ever to engage in or work for reward in any occupation or work for which he or she is reasonably qualified by education, training or experience. Some definitions require that the insured not be able to engage in any occupation. Others require only that the insured not be able to engage in his or her own occupation. Some also require that the insured be under regular medical care. Whatever definition is used, determining whether the insured meets that definition can involve complex questions of fact and disputed evidence. That is reflected in the higher average claim resolution times for TPD claims as compared to other types of claims that we saw earlier. It's also reflected in a witness statement that we sought from MLC concerning its handling of four specific claims made under TPD policies. In each of those four cases, the insured person commenced legal proceedings against MLC in connection with MLC's handling of their TPD claim. In each of those four cases, MLC later settled the claim with the insured. In each of the cases, MLC has accepted to the Commission that it engaged in misconduct. In the first case, MLC accepted that it had breached its duty to act reasonably in considering and determining whether the insured satisfied the TPD definition in the policy. MLC said that the claims assessor did not give sufficient weight to the reasonable and consistent explanations forthcoming from several sources that address the various matters that she considered adverse to the insured's claim. MLC also said that a preliminary view was taken toward the claim which proved resistant to the further evidence subsequently received. In the second case, MLC accepted that it had breached its duty of good faith and fair dealing. It said that it had sufficient medical evidence supporting the insured's TPD claim to make a decision on that claim in late 2014 but unreasonably delayed in making that decision until December 2015. In the third case, MLC also accepted that it had breached its duty of good faith and fair dealing. It said that there was inordinate delay in assessing the claim marked by unnecessary repetition of work. It said that it had sufficient information to determine to admit the claim in November 2014 but did not make a decision until October 2015. It said that its delay suggested that it may not have had due regard to the insured's interests. MLC attributed this delay in part to the fact that the claim was handled by four different assessors over the life of the claim. In the fourth case, MLC also accepted that it had breached its duty of good faith and fair dealing 
it said that there was again inordinate delay in assessing the claim, marked by lengthy periods of inactivity and a failure by MLC to resolve critical issues that were identified at the stage of initial assessment. MLC said that the delay suggested that it may not have paid due regard to the insured's interests. In the second and fourth cases, MLC said that there were two main reasons for the unreasonable delay that constituted a breach of its duty of good faith and fair dealing and therefore misconduct in relation to the claim. First, the process for oversight of claims files at the relevant time was deficient, in particular because team leaders could not readily identify when no action had been taken on a file for a length of time. And second, the process for handover of files from one assessor to another was also acknowledged to be deficient. Commissioner, I tender the witness statement of Luke Hyde, dated the 28th of August 2018, which deals with those four cases. That will become Exhibit 6.115. Returning to the data provided by the 10 life insurers, could we please show document RCD 0026 0002 0005? This chart shows for each of the 10 insurers, the percentage of claims declined as a proportion of all claims received in respect of TPD policies in 2017 to 18. As we can see from the chart, the rate of declined claims ranged from approximately 2 to 3 per cent for Westpac and AMP to approximately 9 to 10 per cent for Suncorp Life and Zurich. I tender that document, Commissioner. Exhibit 6.116, the chart of declined TPD claims as a percentage of all TPD claims by entity, 1 July 17 to 30 June 18, RCD 0026 0002 0005, Exhibit 6.116. Could we please show document RCD 0026 0002 0006? Uh, now, this chart shows the average or mean time it took each of the 10 insurers to reach a decision in respect of claims received under TPD policies received in 2017 to 18. And as we can see from this chart, the average duration between receipt of a claim and a decision ranged from less than 40 days for Zurich to 184 days in the case of Westpac. We note that although Westpac and AMP had the longest decision times, they also had the lowest rates of declined TPD claims. As we've noted, these are substantially longer periods to resolve a claim than for life cover. However, the range represents a substantial improvement on the figures for the 2013 to 14 financial years, where the average mean time for resolution of TPD claims ranged from 74 days for Westpac to 389 days for AMP. Tender the document, Commissioner. Exhibit 6.117, average days to resolve a TPD claim by entity, 1 July 17 to 30 June 18, RCD 0026 0002 0006, Exhibit 6.117. The third type of policy is income protection cover, which replaces income lost by the policyholder through inability to work due to injury or sickness. As with TPD cover, when an insured person makes a claim under an income protection policy, one of the main areas of dispute that can arise is whether the insured meets the relevant definition of illness, injury or disability under the policy. Another area of dispute that can arise concerns the determination of the insured person's pre-disability income. Some of the difficulties that can arise in connection with income protection claims are reflected in a witness statement that we obtained from CMLA concerning its handling of a specific claim under an income protection policy. In the case described in that statement, CMLA accepted that its conduct fell below community standards and expectations and amounted to misconduct. 
CMLA declined the insured's claim on the basis of an exclusion in his policy. The insured made a complaint to FOS, which made a recommendation in his favour. CMLA agreed with the recommendation and paid the insured. CMLA said that it now considers that it failed to adequately investigate the circumstances of the termination of the insured's employment. It said that this provided the insured with a poor customer outcome and constituted a breach of duty by CMLA in that it failed to take reasonable care. Commissioner, I tender the witness statement of Malcolm Weir, dated the 28th of August, 2018. That statement becomes Exhibit 6.118. The difficulties that can arise in connection with income protection claims are also illustrate, illustrated by the case studies that will be examined in the coming days concerning TAL. Returning to the data provided by the 10 life insurers, could we please show document RCD 0026 0002 007? And this chart shows for each of the 10 insurers, the percentage of claims declined as a proportion of all claims received in respect of income protection policies in 2017 to 18. And as we can see from this chart, the rate of declined claims for income protection claims was broadly consistent across the 10 insurers, ranging from less than 3% for AMP, Westpac, Westpac and AIA, to approximately 6.5% in the case of Suncorp Life. I tender that document. A chart of declined income protection claims as a percentage of all income protection claims by entity 1 July 17 to 30 June 18, RCD 0026 0002 0007, exhibit 6.119. Could we please show document RCD 0026 0002 0008? <coughs> this chart shows the average or mean time that it took each of the 10 insurers to reach a decision in respect of claims received under income protection policies received in 2017 to 18. And as we can see from this chart, the average number of days between receipt of a claim and a decision ranged from 23 days in the case of Zurich to approximately 50 days in the case of AMP and AIA. I tender this document. Chart of average days to resolve income protection claim by entity 1 July 17 to 30 June 18, RCD 0026 0002 0008, exhibit 6.120. The fourth and final type of policy is trauma cover, which provides cover to a policyholder if they're diagnosed with a specified illness or injury. One of the main areas of dispute that can arise in relation to claims made under trauma policies is whether the insured suffered from the illness or injury specified in the policy. Trauma policies contain lists of the different medical conditions in relation to which cover is provided, and each medical condition on the list is defined in the policy. Determining whether an insured person's condition satisfies a medical definition under a trauma policy can involve complex questions of fact and disputed medical evidence. Particular issues can arise where medical practices change, but the definition in the policy is not updated to reflect those changes. We will explore some of those issues in the next case study, which concerns CMLA's handling of two specific claims made under trauma policies. Could we please show RCD 0026 0002 0009? This chart shows, for each of the 10 insurers, the percentage of claims declined as a proportion of all claims received in respect of policies for trauma cover in 2017 to 18. And as can be seen from this chart, the rate of declined claims is significantly higher across the entities than for other policy types, ranging from approximately 6 to 8% for MLC and Zurich 
to more than 28 per cent for MetLife. I tender that document. Chart of declined trauma claims as a percentage of all trauma claims by entity 1 July 17 to 30 June 18 RCD 0026 0002 0009 exhibit 6.121. Could we please show RCD 0026 0002 0010? This chart shows the average or mean time it took each of the 10 insurers to reach a decision in respect of trauma claims received in 2017 to 18. And as we can see from the chart, the average number of days between receipt of a claim and a decision ranged from 15 days for Zurich to 67 days in the case of MLC. I tender that document. Chart of average days to resolve a trauma claim by entity 1 July 17 to 30 June 18 RCD 0026 0002 0010 exhibit 6.122. The third and final topic that we'll deal with is the remuneration of claims handling personnel. We ask the 10 life insurers to tell the Commission about how they remunerate their claims handling staff. In particular, we ask them to explain what variable remuneration is available to claims handling staff and what performance indicators are used to determine whether the staff receive remuneration and, if so, how much. When we first asked the life insurers for this information, many of them provided only limited examples of the remuneration arrangements for their claims handling staff. When we asked again, it became clear from the information received that over the last five years, many life insurers have used performance indicators for their claims handling staff that reward the finalisation or closure of claims. We give some examples. Westpac told the Commission that for the performance review period in 2013, a measure called managing claims results had a weighting in its scorecard. It said that over time, there was an awareness that this measure was not focused on the outcomes that Westpac wanted to achieve. It said that this measure was removed from scorecards for claims consultants and claims team managers in September 2015 and from the scorecard for the head of claims management, Life Insurance, in September last year. CMLA told the Commission that in 2016, Ernst & Young conducted two reviews of the KPIs for claims personnel from the 2015 and 16 financial years. At this time, its scorecard included references to claims financial outcomes, such as termination rates and loss ratios. Ernst & Young considered that given the weighting of other KPIs in the scorecard, the inclusion of these measures was unlikely to have incentivised undesirable behaviour by claim staff. But following the report, CMLA removed any references to claims financial outcomes from its scorecards. ANZ told the Commission that before the 2017 financial year, the financial and discipline KPI for most one-path claim staff generally included objectives in relation to the ratio of premiums received to payments made in respective claims during the year and the number of claims closed against overall business plans. In those years, the financial and discipline KPI accounted for 20 to 30 per cent of the employee scorecard. TAL provided the Commission with copies of its KPIs for 2013 to 2017. In 2015, 50% of TAL's scorecard for claims case managers depended on business matters. One of the matters taken into account in determining a claim manager's performance in this area was whether he or she had achieved budgeted profit targets by managing claims to outcomes in line with assumptions underpinning loss ratio targets. In 2016, 20% of TAL's scorecard for the claims team manager was managing claims to outcomes, 
which was measured by reference to whether the team manager met or exceeded particular team-based targets. In 2017, a similar measure entitled Manage Claims to Outcomes, Achieve Claim Closure and Open Claim Targets was given a 15% weighting in the scorecards for the claims team manager, senior case managers and claims case managers. Suncorp Life told the Commission that in the 2014 financial year, Profit and Financials had a 15% weighting in its scorecard for case managers and claims advisors, and one of the relevant measures was expenditure on individual claims over a 12-month period. For the 2015 to 17 financial years, Profit and Financials increased to a 40% weighting. In the 2015 and 16 financial years, one of the relevant measures was claims resolution termination experience. In the 2018 financial year, profit and financials increased again to a 50% weighting, and one of the relevant measures was a life claims resolution target. Suncorp Life also told the Commission about other benefits that it had provided to employees to encourage the resolution of claims. These included a claims resolution drive that it conducted in 2014 and a program called the Choice Awards that it conducted from mid-2016 to mid-2017. Suncorp Life exhibited a document about the Choice Awards to its statement. And if we could bring that document up, SUN 1600003. We see the document exhibited to Suncorp Life Statement, the choice claims resolution drive, and if we turn to 0005 in the document, we see that the document shows that claims managers were awarded points for claims resolutions and for release of reserves, which insurance companies are required to hold while claims remain unresolved. And at 0006 over the page, we see that there were cash prizes for individuals and teams with the highest resolution rates and reserve release rates. Commissioner, I tender the witness statements that set out the information that we have referred to. In relation to TAL, I tender the witness statement of Justin Delaney, dated the 27th of August 2018. It becomes Exhibit 6.123. In relation to AIA, I tender the witness statement of Michael Thornton, dated the 23rd of August 2018. Exhibit 6.124. In relation to MLC, I tender the witness statement of Sean McCormack, dated the 27th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.125. The witness statement of Natalie Cameron, dated the 28th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.126. And the witness statement of Russell Jansen, dated the 6th of September 2018. Exhibit 6.127. In relation to Westpac, I tender the witness statement of Susan Horton, dated the 28th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.128. In relation to Zurich, I tender the witness statement of Timothy Howell, dated the 23rd of August 2018. Exhibit 6.129. And the witness statement of Sharif Hamza, dated the 23rd of August 2018. Exhibit 
In relation to MetLife, I tender the witness statement of Gary Ballison, dated the 23rd of August 2018. Exhibit 6.131. The witness statement of Mark Rabiger, <coughs> dated the 23rd of August 2018. Exhibit 6.132. In relation to ANZ, I tender the witness statement of Gerard Kerr, dated the 23rd of August 2018. Exhibit 6.133. And in relation to Suncorp, I tender the witness statement of Christopher McHugh, dated the 27th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.134. And finally, in relation to AMP, I tender the witness statement of Megan Beer, dated the 31st of August 2018. Exhibit 